Okay, we'll start our question time. I'll, I'll, I'll use my position, my privileged position as chair to start off the question time with two questions, uh, as comments as, and questions as well. Okay, in, um, in 1972 in Beijing, the Chinese Premier Zhao Enlai was asked about the impact of the Great French Revolution of 1789 and its relevance. Zhao famously commented that it was too early to say. Would you, do you feel that that also applies to the Russian Revolution, knowing full well that the Russian revolutions, the Russian revolutionaries, the Bolsheviks, were self-consciously compared their revolution to the great French Revolution of 1789? And there's a, there's a similar trajectory, in actual fact, between the two revolutions. And my second question, a famous anecdote. After the fall of the Soviet Union, ex-party secretary Mikhail Gorbachev visited the, the old German Social Democratic Party leader, Willy Brandt, and the story goes that Willy Brandt refused to see Gorbachev, declaring that Gorbachev had, perhaps inadvertently, caused the collapse of the alternative Soviet model and the actually existing socialisms that held capitalism in check and maintained the social democratic reformist welfare state that people in the West had enjoyed since the Second World War, described by the late historian Eric Hobsbawm as a golden age. With the collapse of the alternative Soviet model, capitalism has returned to, the to a type of a Dickensian 19th century model of laissez-faire capitalism, red in tooth and claw. Your comments on that, please. Okay. The Chinese do have a unique ability to look at things in historical perspective. However, I don't entirely agree. I think that the relevance of the October Revolution um, is unfolding today. I doubt that that relevance has finished, that its impact will develop and will be used in different ways in different countries. Um, but I don't think it's too soon to say that it was an event that, as John Reed said, shook the world, but he said 10 days. I think, for the rest of human history, if we manage to save the planet. Roger, you can take the second one. <laughs> well, let me say, if the 1917 revolution, if it's too early for, to make a comment on it, um, it to, to judge it, um, it seems like a lot of people spent a lot of time uh, both judging it and actually trying to destroy it. So, in that sense, I think that's a misplaced observation. Um, did Gorbachev allow capitalism to re-flourish? Well, I think his attempts to reform the Soviet Union were uh, flawed almost from the very beginning. Um, it's a complicated story, obviously, but I think the big error he made, amongst other things, was to actually adopt a sort of social democratic model from the West, a liberal democratic model, uh, and on that basis, he actually undermined the one instrument that he had, or possibly had, to reform the system, which it certainly needed to do, uh, and that was to actually withdraw the Communist Party as a, a leading body um, within society and politics. Um, the West certainly has, well, two things. He was very short-sighted when he made an agreement um, with, um, let me just think, with Reagan. Bush, yeah, was it with Reagan? Yeah, thanks, I'm just trying to think of the, it wasn't with Reagan, it was uh, with the Secretary of State, but he basically made an agreement, well, we'll withdraw our troops from East Germany and so forth, uh, but you will, uh, you know, on the understanding that there will be no expansion of NATO. Well, NATO continues to not only exist, but is right up against the borders of the current uh, of Russia today. Shame. So, uh, in that sense, uh, at the very least, he actually facilitated not only the collapse of the Soviet Union, but, in fact, he uh, gave a, a, free, a, a free pass, if you like, uh, certainly to the military alliance of NATO. I could say more, but I won't. 
yeah, g'day, um, Brian Concannon. Yeah, I've, I've read a bit of um, the history on Russia from um, supposed uh, credible sources. Um, so I'm keen to hear your view on a um, couple of things I've read. One was um, during the Second World War, apparently um, Tsar Nicholas I, or uh, I'm not sure exactly who, sent a fleet of warships to the American coast, which actually changed the course of the Second World War. Uh, Are we talking about the First World War or is it like just the first The American Revolution. Oh. This is going. And, oh. But what I'm leading to, like, uh, apparently that caused the, um, the difference between the, um, the result of the um, <coughs> American Revolution. But it, they say that um, the Russian Revolution, 1917, was payback for that by the House of Rothschilds and their bankers. And um, apparently 60 million um, Russian Christians were murdered as a result. Is there any truth to that? And was there a, a high Jewish um, input into it? Uh, that, that has no credibility at all, I'm afraid. Sorry. That perspective. By the way, yeah, the, the, the whole idea, if that's what you're suggesting, that the revolution was, a, let's say, a Jewish conspiracy, well... That's certainly what the Nazis thought. But um, What about the 60 million uh, Russian Christians murdered? Is there any... No, I did, don't... Was I there any casualties at all? Well, there were casualties, but I don't think those figures... Can you put a number up. on the casualties, being a historian like you are? Not on the number of Christians who, who died, Rush, but to be, to be honest, I don't think we can really continue this discussion because you are yeah. off. There's certain things you can't talk about, especially when it comes to uh, Judea excuse, Inc. Excuse me, that's... Just Judea Inc. runs the world. Excuse me... End it. Evil! That's, uh, actually, the, 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 that sounds like Black Hundred propaganda. The Black Hundreds were precursors of the Nazis and they spread anti-Semitic smears. Okay, back to reality. Yeah, we um, are. Uh, yeah, they were really good talks. Um, Jim's my name, by the way. Um, I just wanted to raise a couple of things. One, uh, focusing on this question of the relevance of the Russian Revolution. We can debate out the, the facts... We can debate out the facts. Right, Jim, lost, my, lost my track. Well, okay, well, well, all right, okay. Yeah, okay, very quickly. When we, when we do try to assess the Russian Revolution, we have to look at it in long term of history. And I, I don't want to make a speech about this, but if we're looking back at you know, the rise of the, the system of slavery, the rise of the system of feudalism, of capitalism. All of those took a long, long time and there were huge upheavals. And I think when we, when we look back on the Russian Revolution, we'll say that was the first one. That was the first attempt to create socialism and there have been a number of attempts afterwards and we can assess the... And I think myself that what's happening in Latin America has extreme relevance to that, um, the Russian Revolution. But the other thing was... The, great, the greatest leader of the Russian Revolution was Lenin. And if you want to look uh, at relevance to today, let's look at some of the key things that Lenin stood for. One, the right of nations to self-determination. How relevant is that today? Catalonia, Kurdistan, um, all around the world, these are the major struggles that are taking place. The, the question of the right of na nations to self-determination was a key element of that. Um, Imperialist chain breaks at its weakest link. Surely that's what's a very extremely relevant uh, point to make in the situation today. The question of all power to the Soviets and the, the need for democratic socialism, I think, is probably the key thing that we must learn from Lenin for the struggle for socialism today. And Finally, the role of leadership and the role of a revolutionary party or a revolutionary organisation, I think, is something that is extremely lacking and is a major topic that we have to debate today. How are we going to replace this capitalist system with a socialist system? How is it going to be done organisationally and politically? These are all extremely relevant topics from Lenin and from the Russian Revolution which are so relevant today, what we've got to do. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I agree very much with what Jim was saying and he made me think of a point which I think is important when we think about relevance. Initially, with the example of the Russian Revolution, there was a tendency to assume it would be the same everywhere. 
And one of the things which I think has flowered in the relevance of the Russian Revolution is a growing understanding that the principles, the fundamentals, are likely to be the, well, will be the same, but the form they take will be so different. And I mean, it reflects in a way also what Roger was saying about the revolution was in such a different time, such a different country. You know, the revolution in Australia will have, if you like, Australian characteristics. It will reflect the history, the culture of this country. And I think that that's something we have learnt over the decades, which is incredibly important. And I mean, it illuminates the debate, say, in very much in Latin America about socialism in the 21st century. You know, how do we... How do we make a revolution which fits in our country, which has these fundamental principles, uh, but fits our history, our working class, our culture? Uh, I really like that observation you made, Hannah, about um, same principles, but different form. I think that's re something really worth um, thinking about. I certainly think, though, I didn't really talk about, in fact, I didn't mention it, this, these debates, no, more than that, these movements, particularly in Latin America, and where, uh, particularly under Hugo Chavez, the late Hugo Chavez, uh, there was, there have been huge discussions about the particular form that, and, uh, that uh, socialism should take, how you get there, and I'd suggest actually the model that has been pursued so far is actually in many respects quite distinct from, from the, 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 the Soviet example. But again, they, the, bad as, for example, the situation has been in Venezuela, you know, the kind of obstacles that they faced and so forth, um, it's nothing like the catastrophic situation that, that the Bolsheviks faced, whether they liked it or not. Just one other point I'd like to make. Um, and that is, I read today, and I, if I can say, I, I've just been to China for the first time, and I had to, well, anyway, I had to reflect a lot harder about exactly where China's going, but Xi Jinping um, said today, apparently, urged uh, academics, he said, academics have to address the issue of socialism in the 21st century. I thought, well, that, that's a good idea. <laughs> um, so uh, I wouldn't entirely wipe China off the map, actually. I think that history's yet to make its judgment about that. And we, we tend to, because of the Russian Revolution, I think we, and especially the collapse of the Soviet Union, oh, well, socialism's all done and dusted. But I think we still need to pay attention to what's happening in China and not just... Uh, dismiss it, the jury may be out in terms of what's going on there and, uh, yeah, what it means for the 21st century. Uh, I'd like to thank Hannah for t t t showing me so much of what solidarity is about in the, in the past. <clears throat> also, uh, I think we really have to ask, what, what is socialism? I've been reading a lot of Noam Chomsky, George Orwell, other people, and I guess Chomsky would contend that they called the, the Bolsheviks called themselves socialists because that had a great deal of prestige to it, attached to socialism. The West called, uh, called the, the, what was happening in the Soviet Union socialist because then they could demonize socialism and say, you don't want this, look at all the horrible things that are happening there. And uh, that's really what I think. I think if, we, if we're saying that the, 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 the Soviet Union is a model for any... So, socialism is surely democracy in the workplace democratic control of the workplace, which the Soviet Union didn't have. So if we're giving ourselves a, a, as a model for the future, this, the, the Russian Revolution, we're giving ourselves a bum steer. We're giving a, a, ourselves a model that has actually failed. If it had been anything like democracy, surely it would have succeeded. And it didn't, because of, not just because of Stalin, but because of, uh, of the lack of democracy in the first place. So that's all I'd like to say. First of all, I don't personally use the word failed. I mean, uh, we've heard several times 
in different ways. This was the first effort. There are going to be a lot more efforts. And as the quote I used, it'll fade and it'll fade again, but it'll come back. I don't think uh, that the question of the Soviet model is actually relevant any longer. The point I made before, that actually people trying to work out how to build socialism in their country are looking at the specific conditions in their country, the history, the culture, and so forth. I don't define socialism, incidentally, as democracy in the workplace. I mean, we can manage to achieve that here and there in even this bloody country. I define it as the working class taking power. It's a much tougher concept, a much more difficult, prolonged, untidy, uneven process. But it is the working class taking power and establishing a planned economy. That's where it starts. Democracy? Well, look at Cuba and how, for example, the American leadership decries Cuba as undemocratic, and yet this is a country in which people at grassroots level comment on and can withdraw their representatives. You know, we have to be very careful about the word democracy. It has been stolen from us by the capitalists and turned into our elections every four years and a few other little bits and pieces like that, which have nothing to do with the rule of the working class. Do you want to go? Yeah. Um, just quickly, well, in 1917, actually, um, and early 18, the Bolsheviks did actually advocate or, and or supported and stood for elections in factory committees and so forth. So they were advocating... Um, uh, workers' control, but only insofar as they were not expropriating, by the way, the local factories, but actually just uh, having, making sure that the owners of the factories were acting responsibly, basically. In other words, they didn't immediately expropriate the, 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 the bourgeoisie, if you like. That wasn't actually the intention. It was forced upon them. But it's correct to say that the thrust of what they knew, uh, workers' control or no, what you really needed to do was to have a different form, a different political form. That's why the question of all power to the Soviets was such a crucial question. And that's why when the so-called coup d'etat occurred in, 19, in October 1917, it was actually premised on, and there were fierce debates about this, but premised on the fact that a seizure of power had to be enacted in and through the Soviets themselves. That was the critical, critical factor. That was socialist democracy, if you like, in action. I have uh, two questions. Uh, first of all, in regard to uh, Lenin, I think there's been a bit of a gilding of a lily here. I mean, I certainly agree that there are many positive things about uh, Lenin, which I agree with, but uh, as well as that, I mean, there's no doubt that he was also an autocrat and a dictator, and in fact, uh, he very much set the... Uh, had it not been for Lenin, what he established there would have been much harder for Stalin to establish his autocratic uh, dictatorship later. So I'd like some uh, comments about that. So how much uh, what Lenin put in place enabled uh, a figure like Stalin later to come along and make it even more autocratic. And the second comment is uh, a question as well. Um, w what I was reading, it's, I, actually it's quite a long time ago I was reading about this, but uh, there was actually before the actual uh, Bolsheviks uh, seized power, there was also another uh, movement, another uh, revolution, uh, which um, which uh, took the reins of power, but uh, what happened was that uh, Lenin actually was the, uh, the a lot of uh, the corporate and um, financial and so on interests in the West knew that the uh, basically the theory goes that they knew that uh, that there was 
going to be a big change in the Soviet Union. There was going to be some sort of socialist system. So it would be better to have in place someone like Lenin, who they knew would... Um, he was already saying that the idea of socialism just in one country, whereas the, uh, the workers' movement, uh, which was in control before Lenin, usurped power from them, wanted to have an international revolution. And so that's why the Western capitalist interests thought it would be better to... Uh, there's even... Uh, some suggestion that they uh, smuggled uh, Lenin back into the Soviet oh, yeah. Union to enable that to happen so that they could okay. have a more tame type of uh, socialist system that wouldn't want to spread revolution to the whole world. Yeah, so, but two questions, yeah. Well, I'm not going to talk too much about this. There's a, essentially, I think, a kind of conspiracy theory operating here. Uh, it's true, there was a secret train that uh, brought Lenin and others where revolution, by the way, wasn't just run by Lenin. Um, it might be worth remembering that. Um, but that was... Undoubtedly, the Germans thought, well, this could undermine the Russian Empire. That was part of the, the thinking. But uh, everything suggests that once the Bolsheviks were really given the opportunity to act politically, they certainly were intent on not just overthrowing the autocracy in Russia, but internationalising that revolution from day one. Um, as for the question of Lenin paving the way for Stalin, I think we need to look much more closely at the social conditions and the siege that the Soviet Union was under almost from day one. And by the way, one might add that almost any state that's under siege, one only has to look at Britain, Australia, Britain, for a start, in the Second World War, resorts to authoritarian uh, means in order to safeguard their interests. Uh, in this case, they were life and death struggle. Good evening, everyone. My name is Raquel. So many of you know me from other social events, uh, political events. Um, what I got to raise here is actually when we're talking about socialism, or socialism on the, on the 21st century, it seemed like everyone here forgot about the old indigenous revolution in Latin America it was older than the 1500, before the Colon discovered us. And then, you know, um, sometimes I expecting when I come into all this forum is someone, you know, talking about our heroes or our independence movement and revolution in Latin America. I have, for example, um, Flora Tristan. I don't know if someone of you know her. She writes in an essay in um, 1843, I say, about socialism. Flora Tristan was a Peruvian woman who fighting for the human rights, for the rights of the people, and was the <coughs> first one to quote proletariat of the world united before Lenin. And you could be checked in Google, you can check in the history book. Her name is Flora Tristan. And then, you know, for me as a Latino American, as a people who fighting in the guerrilla fight in the MLN in Uruguay, and I know the history in Uruguay very well too. We have some hero in Uruguay called Artigas. Artigas was win the revolution against the Spanish Imperium. And he uh, did the um, agrarian reform with the give the land to everyone. The people follow him. He abolished uh, uh, slavery. And that was back in uh, 1813. You know, and then we reckon, I reckon the, the big thing and the history uh, powerful to the movement around the world, the Russian Revolution, but I like to our revolution and our indigenous does. Now, Evo Morales, you know, all the movement for the indigenous people asking for the land is because they know they need to return back to the old time when we used to live as a community, share everything, have all the equal right, you know. And then I saw in all this forum, that is like missed. It's nobody talking ever about all the stuff. I'm sorry about my English because it's not so good. I don't plan into talking. But, you know, I've been moved to, to talking because I'm being so many in this forum. And we're planning to do one forum on the 18th of November. I invite everyone to do okay. it. 
is in Spanish, but he's a professor from Uruguay who writes in so many book history. He was an uh, exile in Russia. And then, you know, we could talking about the hundred years of the Russian Revolution. Thank you very much, yeah. and I'm sorry. It's, you know, yeah. I annoy someone yeah. with that. Yeah. What? Uh, thank you for your intervention. <laughs> I will t we'll take that as a comment. Roger has to catch a train. He's got to go back to Newcastle. Um, so we'll get the railway line, but I still have to go back there. <laughs> Bar bus. Mm. So thank you very much. To I want to, uh, sorry, just let me make a, a quick comment. Thank you very much for reminding us that although we look at the Russian Revolution because it was so decisive, it was so important, we should remember that people have been struggling for justice, for equality, for community long before and you know, the Russian Revolution didn't come out of nothing. You know, it came out of humanity's desire for a better world and to find a way to create it. And there are so many struggles which I think we in Australia don't know about in other parts of the world. And I'm very grateful that you were able to remind us just briefly. Thank you. Um, Robert Austin, um, mine is very briefly also on Latin America. Yeah, I've got a do you, do, you, do you want to read it yourself? Yeah, I want, I want you to. I'm not, yes, I do. Shall I continue? Yep, yep. Um, it was it very briefly to say a couple of things. Firstly, I've just had the pleasure of co-editing a special edition of the journal World Tensions on the Russian Revolution and Latin America, 100 years of the Russian Revolution in Latin America, which takes up several of the issues that have come up today. Uh, it's being co-edited by a professor from Buenos Aires uh, named Deborah D'Antonio, a professor from Sao Paulo in Brazil named Camila Acosta, and myself from the University of Sydney. And, and it points out the quite uh, complex legacy, I might say, of the Soviet Revolution in, or the Russian Revolution in Latin America, distinguishing, and I noticed Roger distinguished in this way, between the levels on the one hand of the formality or the bureaucracy of the revolution and, and the masses, the people. Uh, so that we find, for example, when the uh, Comintern uh, oriented Cuban Communist Party uh, did, believe it or not, a deal with Batista, mm. the first Batista dictatorship, uh, and supported the first Batista dictatorship from below, the Afro-Cuban labour movement uh, put enormous pressure on them until by the time of the 50s, and this is in fact, as Steve Cushion points out in the same <coughs> journal, uh, part of the untold story of the Cuban revolution, pressured the Communist Party to take an entirely different approach through the unions. And it was only, in fact, through the labour movement and it calling a general strike in particular on the 1st of January 1959 that the Cuban Revolution could, it could have actually gone through. So I wondered if you want to comment upon that. I think it's very important that we uh, insert Latin America in, in a more positive way, as, as Raquel has suggested, into the debate. And that journal, by the way, is open access. It's online. It's called World Tensions. And from the 1st of November, more on the Latin American calendar than the Russian one, um, it will be available free of charge in Spanish, Portuguese, and English. Uh, thanks, Robert. Look, I think because of what is happening in Latin America at the moment, the experiences there are things we should inform ourselves about. But I suspect that we need to do more than that. We need to admit that in many ways in Australia, we are rather isolated and our media serves us very poorly and that development in this part of the world, in, in Asia and the Pacific. I mean, I did some work with the Shamoro people on Guam, and I was amazed to find that the vast majority of people in Australia have no idea that Guam exists, let alone the difficulties it, the, the indigenous people there face. I think we are as a progressive movement in Australia, 
ignorant, you know, about the rest of the world. I mean, of course, we work here. We need to know the conditions, the problems here first and foremost. But what is happening in Latin America, the lessons there, what, are, what is happening in Asia and the Pacific are things we really must get more educated about. I don't, uh, I'm not speaking anymore, just I'm putting question in a simple way. Uh, with Marxist outlook, how do you view the prime contradiction on global scale? The prime contradictions on global scale. Then, and in respect of Australia, what is the prime contradiction prevalent in this country? Um, what, what is the, the prime or the major contradiction on a world scale and in Australia? It is a very difficult question to answer at 8 o'clock <laughs> when everybody's thinking about their bus and their train home. Look, uh, I suppose we would say nowadays that the, the major contradiction in Australia remains that between the private ownership of production and the social nature of production. Um, but that elaborates into so many other aspects where there are fundamental contradictions that I actually don't want to go on because once I get started it's it's impossible um, to answer that with respect to the questioner in so brief a time. My name's uh, Bruce Toms. Uh, I take your point about revolutions are not a matter of individuals but of masses of people. Uh, but there are certain individuals who stand out. Now, one of them was Trotsky. Now, Trots Trotskyism has, has gone on since the revolution. But has it got any connection with the historical figure of Leon Trotsky or, or not? What what is the problem with between Trotskyism and well Marxism Leninism if you like? Bruce, you are an old friend, but that's an impossible question <laughs> to answer briefly. I will just make a couple of points. I was yesterday, the twenty fifth was the sort of revolution day. It was also my 75th birthday. I have, I have spent my life really in these debates. And as I said at the beginning of my contribution, I don't play the Lenin, Stalin, Trotsky game. I don't think it helps us very much. Does modern day Trotskyism have anything to do with the figure of Leon Trotsky? Yes, in some ways, of course. But, you know, Trotsky played an extremely important role in the revolution. And although I am critical of Trotskyism in its form nowadays, I have a great deal of respect for what Leon Trotsky did. And, you know, if you sort of say, what's the difference between Trotskyism and Marxism, Leninism, I would need, I think, to ask you, well, which group of Trotskyists, in which country, at what time are you talking about? And, and then I might say, well, there are these similarities and there are these differences. Uh, more than that, um, really, we, can't, we don't have time for. Yep. Uh, Leon Trotsky's History of the Russian Revolution, a brilliant literary piece of work, has recently been republished. I recommend people read it. Excellent history. My name's Holger Kovit. Now, I love the idea of um, workers' power, workers' rights. But um, well, when I, I thought I was going to become redundant about 30 years ago, I remember 
saying to my union boss there, let's fight it now. We cannot go on strike after we have lost our jobs. Now, we have high unemployment and the digital age is putting more and more people out of work. Robots are taking over in the factories. Now, is there any future for workers? I, I think they may end up um, like draft horses, uh, only good, good for the glue factory. Uh, my answer to that, socialise the automated means of production. <laughs> One of the things I think we need to remember is that this country is atypical. You know, what tends to be called the third world is the vast majority of humanity. And the problems that you are talking about, which are real for workers in this country, are not affecting them to the same extent. If we can develop just socialist societies the use of technology to free people from the kind of demeaning labour that they are often involved in, to free them from poverty, to allow them to spend more time reading, writing, going to university, picking flowers if they want to. You know, if we can do that, then technology is to be welcomed. You know, we have to remember, one that technology is used against us as workers. And secondly, that technology problems that you are talking about are atypical of the vast majority of the world, which also need socialism to improve, you know, their, their culture, their, their rights, their right to plenty, their right to a job, their right to education, their right to clean water, their right to so many other things. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll, just, I'll just end by paraphrasing Zhaan Lai in relation to the impact and relevance of the Russian Bolshevik Revolution of 1917. It's too early to say. <laughs>